We're going to go to 2 Corinthians in your Bible. 2 Corinthians in the first chapter. And then when you get there, we're going to turn to another passage to read before we look into 2 Corinthians. But you might get 2 Corinthians in your Bible and then leave a marker there and turn back to the back of your New Testament to the book of Hebrews. The last large book as you move toward the back of your New Testament before you get to the book of Revelation. And we're going to look in Hebrews chapter 12. A constant reminder, and this is what Paul's dealing with when he writes to the Corinthians. The place of suffering. The place of affliction. In God's plan for his children. And none of us enjoy, in the one sense, affliction and suffering. That's something we must endure. The joy we have through that is knowing that God is sovereignly at work in our lives, even in the pain, even in the unpleasantness. Paul's reminding the Hebrew Christians that he's writing to, maybe not Paul, but whoever wrote Hebrews, uh, He's reminded them of the testimony of the lives of Old Testament saints in chapter 11 who were faithful. They hung on to the promises of God even though they did not live to see those promises fulfilled. They will enjoy the fulfillment of those promises in the plan of God. Then he comes into chapter 12, reminds them of that great cloud of witnesses, encourages them at the end of verse 1 to run with endurance the race set before us. We have to be faithful in our time in the situations that God brings into our lives, both personally and individually and into our life as a congregation of believers, God's family in this place. We are to be, verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And the result is glory. He is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So he endured the suffering, the pain, the agony of the cross. Looked like great defeat, but it was great victory. Then he reminds them, consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not resisted to the point of shedding blood and you're striving against sin. We noted as we studied the uh, first part of chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians, the afflictions, the suffering that come into our lives can take uh, a variety of forms. For some, like these Hebrew Christians, a lot of it centers into persecution for their faith. But then that bleeds off into other areas as we saw when we studied this book. They lost jobs. They lost homes. Uh, There was financial cost. Uh, Whatever the suffering, whatever the trial, we recognize God's sovereign hand in it. So he moves on and tells them in verse 5, You have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And he scourges every son whom he receives. That's God's plan. The discipline here is not just what we would think of punishment for doing the wrong thing. It's the child training process, if you remember. It's what's necessary in God training us and developing us and growing us to maturity. It is for discipline that you endure. Recognizing God is training and maturing me as his child. That gives me endurance. The trial, the affliction is painful. 
It's unpleasant, whatever form it takes. But, as a believer, I see the hand of God in it. He is working his purposes for what is best for me, what is necessary for me, and for us as a congregation to grow, to mature. Verse 7, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you're without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you're not legitimate children at all. You're not sons. Then he compares it to earthly fathers who really love their children. They bring discipline into their lives. Verse 10, they disciplined us for a short time. It seemed best to them. He disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And for many of you who have been believers for many years, you can testify to the truth of this, how you've grown through the difficult times, how some of the most unpleasant things that you've had to go through in your life as a believer, as you look back on it, you can see they were times of great growth as you learned to trust the Lord, to lean upon him, to find him sufficient, and he brought you through. And you grew in righteousness, in your character, and you learned to trust him more. Come back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. This is the very kind of situation the Apostle Paul is dealing with uh, as he writes to the Corinthians. It has a little different focus with where he's going, but it's helping the Corinthians understand God's purpose in affliction and suffering. We learn to experience his comfort and strength. The Corinthians had developed the thinking of the world to a large extent. When I am strong, then I am strong. Weakness was frowned upon. And Paul was being presented in that light from some unsavory and unbelieving teachers who had infiltrated among the Corinthian church and were trying to undermine their confidence in the Apostle Paul. In verses 3 to 7 of chapter 1, he began reminding the Corinthians of the comfort and strength God brings to us in all our afflictions and sufferings. Doesn't matter what they are. He's the God of all comfort, we notice at the end of verse 3, who in verse 4 comforts us in all our affliction. So he's reminding them of that. God is sufficient. His comfort and strength is realized most fully in trial. He followed that up in verses 8 to 11 by telling them of a crushing affliction that God brought into his life. And Paul endured many things, and this obviously was one of the more serious. He doesn't go into detail of what it was. We talked about some of the possibilities. Could have been the result of persecution while he was in Asia Minor. Now he says this happened in Asia, a city like Ephesus, where we know from the book of Acts something of the suffering he endured. We also talked about a physical affliction that seemed to plague the Apostle Paul, and he'll come and talk about that more fully when we get to the end of this letter was a messenger of Satan that came to buffet him and make his life miserable physically. Whatever it was, uh, might have been uh, a reoccurring physical ailment. Some have projected a form of malaria, you know, that sometimes can lay dormant in a body, then flare up, uh, that kind of illness. Uh, whatever it was, it brought Paul to the point of death. He gave any, uh, ho up any hope of surviving 
That's how serious the suffering and affliction that he was going through. But he said God had a purpose in it. Verse 9. We had the sentence of death within ourselves, note, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. And uh, as a believer, many of you have experienced times like this where you just give up all hope. I don't see how we can get through this. I don't know how I'll be able to endure this. You may have come to the point of physical death. Uh, We give up all human hope. Uh, We just cast ourselves on the mercy of God. God, I'm in your hands. I'm ready if you should call me. Um, There's nothing I can do. That's a time of growth. Paul said, that's why God brought this into my life. You know, we're never done growing. We're never done maturing. No matter how long we've known the Lord and walked with him, there's still more growth to experience. Paul said, God brought this affliction so uh, he would learn not to trust in himself. That's a part of the growing. He wrote to the Philippians in chapter 3 and said, I haven't arrived yet, but I am in relentless pursuit of the goal of perfection in Christ in all areas of my life. And he's reminded in verse 10, God not only delivered in the past, he will deliver in the present. And that assures me he will deliver in the future. He delivered us from so great a peril of death, he will deliver us And he's the one on whom we've set our hope. He will yet deliver us. And that's one thing that happens as we look back on those dark times in our lives. Those times of heartache, heartbreak, pain, suffering. But the Lord brought us through. And that's the privilege of walking with the Lord for many years. We can testify, you know, I have always found God faithful. He has brought me through, and here I am today. By the way, there were times I thought, this can't work out. Uh, This will bring ruin. This will be the end. It wasn't. And we learned to trust him. And we develop a firm, settled confidence. He'll deliver us in the future. I don't know what the future holds. You don't know. But if you're a believer... You know God is sufficient. He will deliver you. It may come to the point, as we saw in Philippians, where he'll deliver you into his presence. Death will come if the Lord doesn't come. But he will deliver on his schedule and plan. Part of the deliverance we experience in this realm comes through the prayers of fellow believers. You know, I think we often fail to appreciate because of the simplicity of prayer that I can go before the eternal God who is sovereign over all, who controls all, and bring the request of my heart to him. I sometimes fail to appreciate the wonder of it. Think about it. If an angel would come down and confront you and say, you can have five minutes to tell Almighty God what is on your heart. Bring the desires of your heart to him. We say, what a privilege. What an honor. But you understand, as a believer, you can do that every day. He encourages you to do it. He invites you to come with confidence to a throne of grace. Imagine that. The God of heaven, enthroned in glory, says to you as his child, come to me with confidence. I won't turn you away. Bring the desires of your heart to me, the burdens of your heart. Cast all your cares on me, for I care for you. And we go day by day, maybe throw off a quick prayer or two on our way. Um, Paul says, you know, you join in helping us through your prayers. 
You join with us. And God responds to your prayers. And my deliverance is partly explained by God responding to you praying for me. You joining in helping us through your prayers so that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the favor. And we noted that word favor, charisma. It's the word grace. For the grace bestowed upon us through the prayers of many. God's grace, his unmerited favor, his provision for us and enablement for us comes in the response to the prayers of believers. Uh, amazing. Paul desired and prayed for the Corinthians in verse 2 of this chapter, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord. He wanted God's enabling grace to be given to them. And he wants them to be praying for him so that God's enabling grace will be provided for him. Single most important thing I believe you can do is pray. Pray for yourself. Pray for the ministry. Pray for your family, your friends. Pray for fellow members of the family of God. Pray for the various ministries. We go before a God who says, come before the throne of grace. Tell me what's on your heart and I will respond. When you come to verse 12, Paul now turns to address some of the criticisms and attacks that have been erected against him by the Corinthian church. How sad it is. You know, criticisms and things that um, bother us, sometimes when you look back, they look awful trite. Hard as you read this section to think that the Corinthian church really made such an issue of nothing. That their confidence in the Apostle Paul and the truth that he taught was being undermined. The attacks on Paul were geared to undermining their people's confidence in Paul and thus in the ministry of the word that he taught. Which would naturally lead them away from faithfulness to Christ as he'll talk about as we get to the end of this letter. Um, look how he picks up in verse 12. For our proud confidence, verse he's going to talk about he has a clear conscience in how he has functioned. The attacks are without foundation. Then he'll go on to address some of those. Our proud confidence, our boasting, uh, a confident assertion, not proud, arrogant, as we would sometimes think of boasting, but his assured confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience. Our conscience um, comes from three Greek words. The preposition with, the, preposi uh, the word, uh, verb to know, and the word myself. To know with myself, be the literal, take the three words. Um, to know with myself. Um, means I'm conscious. We sometimes think of the conscious as that inner voice that speaks concerning what is right, what is wrong. We talk about having a guilty conscience. Why? Because we believe we did something wrong. Uh, we say, I have a clear conscience, meaning uh, we believe we've done what was correct. Paul says, the testimony of my conscience is good. Uh, I have a clear conscience. I'm being accused of being untrustworthy, of speaking out of both sides of my mouth. That's not true. I have a clear conscience. Now, a conscience in and of itself is not totally reliable. But it is foundational. Foundational. 
back up to the book of Romans, chapter 2. Everyone has a conscience. Um, that enables us to function in the world to a large extent um, because there's a sense of certain things are right, certain things are wrong. Now, there's not always agreement on what those things are, but certain things there's general agreement. Uh, there's just something in us that says that's not right. For example, you know, it gets harder to find examples as our society becomes more degenerate. But for example, child molestation. There's probably universal agreement that that is wrong. How do they know that? There's just something inside that says that's not right. It's wrong. No matter how you excuse it, it's wrong. And our laws reflect that. In Romans chapter 2, the Apostle Paul writes in verse 14, For when Gentiles who do not have the law, referring to the Mosaic law, that was given to the Jews. Gentile nations, where they were, did not have the Mosaic law to be a standard for them. So the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively, that word instinctively, Literally, do by nature, uh, by their very makeup. You see, we're created in the image of God. There is a recognition of right and wrong. Uh, they do by nature the things of the law. These not having the law are a law to themselves. In other words, uh, even the Gentiles who did not have the word of God to guide them recognize certain things are right and wrong. We see that in our society today, even with its degeneracy. Even those who would claim to reject any concept of God, uh, refuse to consider him in their life, still have a sense certain things are right, certain things are wrong. It's wrong to treat people one way, it's right to treat them another. There's certain standards that are innate. Uh, we do it by nature. That's the way God created us. Uh, that we are unique. We are different than the animal world, for example. Um, in that, verse 15, they show the work of the law written in their hearts. And when God created them, he created them in his image. Now sin has marred that image. Oh, the conscience is not a uh, fully reliable guide. And it can be marred, it can be deadened. We'll read some verses in a moment. But it is still a basic foundational guide, even to the unbeliever. They show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience. And that's what we're talking about. When Paul says, my conscience testifies. Their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. Uh, that's how the conscience works within them. So in their thoughts, in their mind, they're giving testimony. I believe that is wrong. I believe that is right. Uh, look back in chapter 1 of Romans and here you see those who have rejected God rejected the revelation of his very character in his creation, are put under the judgment of God. And that's all men, uh, universally. So God gave them over in judgment. And you'll read in verse 26. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passion, for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. Sexual sin. And so they quit functioning that which is according to nature to that which is contrary to their very nature. And in their heart they know it's wrong. Fifty years ago, the overwhelming majority would have voted that certain sexual activities were sinful and wrong. And the minority who didn't agree with the majority would have tried to be quiet about it. Uh, now that has changed. And we find sweeping the country and the world is a degeneracy that promotes and says it's all right. 
And this is what happens, and we need to be aware. The world shapes us into its mold if we're not careful. Because what they do is change the standard of what is right and wrong. And the conscience functions in connection to the standard it has. And fallen man is determined to suppress and reject the testimony of his conscience as God created him and declare what God has said is wrong, we say is right. You know what happens? What sweeps the country? How did I was reading an article, the change in voting on some of these things and public opinion polls. Now you can have the majority go a different way. Why? The standard set down for their conscience is changing. Even though they know in their heart this is unnatural. They reject it. Come over to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 1, the Spirit explicitly says, in latter times, some will fall away from the faith. Some who had professed the faith will depart from the faith. And they'll pay attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. This is the danger the church at Corinth is facing. As Paul will make clear uh, later on, they're following after demonic beings who have come as angels of light. By means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. See what's happened. Their conscience has been seared. Uh, some of you have studied Greek. It's an interesting word. One reason, just because of how long it is. Uh, I believe it has 16 letters in it in Greek, this one word. A little long word. It means to brand with a hot iron. So seared, cauterized, it's deadened. Uh, they have their consciences uh, branded with a hot iron. It's seared, it's cauterized, it's deadened. Um, and so they teach false things. Forbidding marriage, you see, it blends, blends into this. It's not a particular doctrine. It's the truth that God has thought about marriage and its place in the plan of God. What God created us to be and to do as male and female. Now they're denying that and teaching something else. And it bleeds into, it goes into other areas. Uh, what's happened? They've deadened their conscience, so they're teaching and promoting and practicing. And this begins to affect the believers. Some will fall away from the faith because they'll listen to this rubbish. And pretty soon they begin to be shaped by it. And our conscience are no longer governed by the word of God, but they're governed by the thoughts and teaching of men. And this constantly presses in on us as we try to fit in a fallen world. And we'd like an acceptance. We'd like an appreciation and yet Jesus says, woe to you when all men speak well of you. But we think that's an accomplishment. Um, it's not. So the conscience has been seared. Turn over to Titus chapter 1, verse 15. To the pure, all things are pure. To those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. You see, the corruption of the conscience built in us as part of our very nature. Humanity created in the image of God, but it's corrupted and defiled by sin. And so it ends up nothing is pure. And we see a tide that seems to be relentless of degeneracy sweeping over. We say, what has happened? I mean, the world's gone crazy. Don't they have any sense of what is right and wrong? They do, but they reject it. Uh, that defilement of sin now, its corruption, is consuming them. And thus, 
Their consciences are defiled. Paul says, uh, I'll turn there, we'll go to one more passage. I'm going to just read, uh, quote it to you. Hebrews chapter 10. If you don't want to turn there. That our conscience is cleansed in Christ. They can summarize it. Our consciences are cleansed from dead works. Our consciences are cleansed in Christ. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Uh, because we have come to the one who is our high priest and accepted his sacrifice on our behalf. And there's a cleansing within that takes place. And now we have a consciousness, a sensitivity to sin that wasn't there before because God has made us new in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, a new creation. Old things have passed away. New things have come. Our conscience has been cleansed. And now, we don't know if that won't go through, Paul repeatedly talks about the importance of having a clear conscience, a good conscience. 1 Timothy 1.5, he says, the goal of our teaching is a good conscience, among other things. You know what? We teach the word of God so that believers will what? Order their lives according to the word of God. And thus have a conscience that doesn't condemn them. We believers need to take our conscience seriously. When you violate your conscience as a believer, that is sin. The conscience isn't the final guide, but to violate your conscience, whatever is not of faith is sin. Paul wrote to the Romans. When you're doing something you believe God would not be pleased with you doing, it is sin. Or when you don't do what God, you believe God would have you do, it is sin. Now, it's not enough to say, I have a clear conscience. Because the conscience isn't a totally reliable guide. But we strive to live with as clear and good a conscience, a life that is conformed to the word. Uh, come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. As we move on here in a moment, you'll see why this area becomes foundational to what Paul's going to say in subsequent verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. Verse 1, let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ, stewards of the mysteries of God, the truth that God has revealed. In this case, moreover, it's required of stewards that one be found trustworthy, handling and teaching the word of God faithfully. To me, it is a very small thing that I may be examined by you or any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself. Now, I'll be careful there because he does examine myself, himself in one sense. He says in the next verse, I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. He is not the final judge. He tries to live with a clear conscience, a good conscience. They'll testify, as we'll see, that he's living in godly holiness and sincerity. But that doesn't mean that he's acquitted. He's not the final judge. I am conscious of nothing against myself. I don't have a guilty conscience in any area. Yet I am not by this acquitted. The one who examines me is the Lord. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time. Wait until the Lord comes who will judge both, bring both... Uh, the Lord comes who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. Then each man's praise will come to him from God. The problem with the Corinthian church, they keep attacking Paul's men, uh, motives, his character. Not anything that he is specifically doing that is sinful, but his motivation. How do you deal with that? Paul says, I don't even take the time to answer it. It doesn't matter to me what you say about my motives. I don't know anything against myself. My conscience is clear as far as I can tell. 
but I don't take it upon myself even to be the final judge of my own motives. So we need to be careful. It's easy for us to say, well, I know what they did, but I don't think they were. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can't see what's in your heart. I can't see what's in your mind. You can't tell. Um, you know, only the Lord looks into the recesses of my heart and mind um, and can truly disclose what was that motive. So Paul said, it's in his hands. It's not free. It is sin for me to be judging the motive. I can judge the conflict. Paul does that repeatedly in writing the conflict. He'll warn about motives. But someone doing what is biblical and yet we attack them thinking their motives are not good, it's hard unless there's a pattern of life that indicate that they have uh, motives that have been clearly manifest. Come back to 2 Corinthians. So this, our proud confidence, our confident assurance is this, the testimony of our conscience. That in holiness and godly sincerity, holiness, moral purity, related to the word saint, um, sanctified, in holiness, um, as those set apart by God for himself, we have attempted to live in holiness, set apart from sin, set apart to God. Godly holiness. That word godly uh, modifies both holiness and sincerity. Um, that's the, the character of God being produced in us. Sincerity, uh, the transparency, word uh, translated sincerity, compound word, the son and judge. You know, in those days, they didn't have artificial light like we do, that we can turn up the light, we want to examine something, we get a brighter light and look at it. Uh, there they hold it up to the sun. So that's what it means, judged by the sun. In the brightness and the fullness of light. Um, so sincerity. I am what you see me to be. Uh, there's no hidden motives. There's no hidden agenda. I've conducted myself Transparently, we might say, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God. And the contrast here, the fleshly wisdom is the wisdom of fallen man. The Corinthians love this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The Corinthians, the Greeks, desire wisdom. We preach Christ crucified. But... To those looking for worldly wisdom, that's foolishness. But the foolishness of God is greater than the wisdom of men. So we didn't function trying to live our lives according to worldly standards. What the world would consider wise, but in the grace of God. And his grace operative in our lives living pleasing to him, enabled and empowered by his grace. We have conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you. Paul says, this is my general pattern wherever I am in the world. I don't conduct myself one way with believers and another way with the world. It is the desire and intention of my heart to live in the context of God's grace operating in me wherever I am. But you especially have experienced God's grace at work in my life. How did the Corinthians become a church? How did they come to know the salvation that's found only in Christ and have the privilege of placing their faith in him? Acts 18 records it. Paul and those with him, Silvanus and Timothy, as he'll mention in a moment, brought the gospel to them. So you especially have seen this. Now he answers some of the accusations and charges. That's a general foundation. For we write nothing else to you than what you read and understand. 
and I hope you will understand until the end. The point is, I have no hidden agendas or hidden motives. Uh, what he wrote is what he meant. We talk about the literal interpretation of Scripture. You read it and take it, if you will, and we might say at face value. This is not some mysterious book uh, and the meanings are hidden and you have to learn something of the intention behind what was written. We might say, read between the lines. You know, he says this, but that's not really what he means. That's what Paul was being accused of. Uh, we don't write anything else than what you read and understand. It's not like these teachers come in and say, well, you know, Paul, he wasn't being up front with you. You see, the attack on Paul's character becomes an attack on the word of God that Paul was giving them. And if they can undermine their confidence in Paul, then they undermine the confidence in Paul's message. Now they no longer are able to take in the purity of the word of God because they've turned aside to false teachers who corrupt it, which Paul will go on to talk about in 2 Corinthians. Uh, we write to you nothing else than what you read and understand. What I write to you is clear. You understand Greek. I wrote you in Greek. We have it in English. It's clear. I hope you will understand until the end. That's not going to change. I didn't write this to delude you or put you off and I'll have something. I hope you understand this is all there will ever be. This is it. What I wrote. Uh, you can understand it. Just as you partially did understand us. Um, and they did. Uh, I mean, he came and preached the gospel to them. He spent 18 months there ministering. They appreciated his ministry. They recognized this is truth. The grace of God broke into their lives. Um, the light of the gospel shone in their hearts. Um, they realized he's a messenger from God bringing us the truth of God. You did partially understand us. And in that context, that we are your reason to be proud as you are also ours in the day of our Lord Jesus. Uh, when we stand before Jesus Christ and are judged by him, they can be proud of the work that God has done in their lives through the ministry of Paul, and Paul can be proud of the work that they've done in his life. You know we will stand there together on that great day. And I will look at you and say, what a joy and blessing it is to see how the word of God that I was privileged to give was used in your life. And you'll look at my life and say, what a blessing to know and joy that we were used in his life in such a great way, and that will go on in our body. We have been joined together as God's family. There will be individual aspect of the judgment, but there will be a corporate aspect of the judgment. We will be gathered there as a church. That's what he's talked about. Here we are. We'll be there. In that day, our joy will be in one another. Why are we trying to tear each other apart? Um, God's work of grace in your life will be my greatest joy when I stand before him. God's work of grace through you in my life will be your greatest joy. What do we think we're accomplishing as we try to undermine one another? Uh, what do the Corinthians think they gain? by trying to attack Paul's motive and undermine his credibility. They're destroying their own rewards. It makes no sense. Uh, turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 19, Paul writes to the Thessalonians, Thessalonians, 
another church in Greece, in Macedonia. Verse 19 of 1 Thessalonians 2. For who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. You know, we constantly have to remind ourselves, God saved us individually, personally. But when he did, he placed us into the body of Christ. And we cannot escape that union. And when we come to be judged before him, our part in that growth of one another's lives will be an essential part of the joy and glory, exaltation that we have in the presence of God. We have serious involvement in one another's lives. Sometimes we get Christians' ideas that, well, you know, it's just me and my relationship to the Lord and that's all I'm concerned about. I have to be concerned about more. I have to be concerned about I faithfully teach you the word. But a burden of my heart and prayer for you is that the word is taught to you. I will do it clearly, understandably in the power of the Spirit. And you will be open to hear it and respond to it. Um, And there is a mutuality in that. Uh, And God is using us in all around, through the body. So come back. Their attacks on Paul are undermining that which will be their very cause for joy and glorying when they stand in the presence of Christ. Um, What a blessing that will be. Uh, Let's move on here. Now, Paul tells what the problem was, and we can overview this quickly. Um, It's difficult to know how many contacts finally Paul had with Corinth, either by letter or by visit. Um, It's way back around. Look back in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. Paul says, I wrote you in my letter. Now, wait a minute. We're reading 1 Corinthians. Well, that's the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians that we have. It's not the first letter he wrote to the Corinthians because he says, I wrote you in my letter. Not to associate with immoral people. And then he explains what he meant when he wrote that. So he'd written them a prior letter, but it's not part of God's inspired scripture preserved for us. Just a little portion uh, that Paul includes there. So it's not something God uh, intends for us to know. But it does remind us there were other contacts here. Uh, Come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul is talking about his impending visit to Corinth. He's in Macedonia, northern Greece, planning to come down to Corinth shortly when he writes his letter. Well, we know he was at Corinth in Acts 18 when he established the church. Now he's talking about coming again. Yet he says in 2 Corinthians 12, 14, here for this third time I am ready to come to you. Then he says in chapter 13, verse 1, this is the third time I'm coming to you. Well, where's the second time? We don't have any record of in Acts. We don't know. Uh, Would you put up the map of Paul's journey here? Uh, You're going to have to follow this. See my finger? On both maps. Uh, Paul's at Ephesus. Can you find it there where the green arrow's coming across? Uh, You see Ephesus. Then you go across to where the pin is, the red pin sticking up, and see Corinth. Paul spends three years in Ephesus. Uh, He was there when he wrote 1 Corinthians. Now, it's possible that Paul, during those three years took the boat across to Corinth. It would take about a week in those days on a sailing vessel to cross over to Corinth. So in three years, he could have crossed over for a quick visit. 
perhaps, uh, we don't know, because there were some particular problems, seems in the letter, there are special problems there. Perhaps the immorality spread, uh, being accepted in the church at Corinth and the man there necessitated it. We don't know for sure. It was an unpleasant experience probably from what is in this letter. Uh, so that's one explanation. You can see how he's end up going. He's going up into Macedonia and then going to come down into Greece. Leave that up a moment and uh, come back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 15, in this confidence I intended to first, at first to come to you so that you might twice receive a blessing. How were they going to twice receive a blessing when he came? That is to pass your way into Macedonia and again from Macedonia to come to you and by you to be helped on my way to Judea. What Paul says his plan was, was he was going to leave Ephesus and come over to Corinth, cross the water. Then from Corinth, he was going to go up into Macedonia. The church is up there, Thessalonica, Philippi. Then he was going to come back down to Corinth. So that would be a second visit. So it would be a double blessing. I'll come spend some time with you. Then I'll go up into Macedonia. Then I'll come back down. We'll spend some more time. That's a double blessing. Be like with your kids if they don't live nearby. And they're going to come for a visit. And they say, we're going to come and spend some time with you. Then we'll go up and visit the other relatives. Then we'll come back down and visit with you some more and stay a little bit longer before we return home. He said, well, that's a double blessing. He says, triple blessing. Because you get to see them twice and they leave once uh, in between. <laughs> but at any rate, then Paul thought he'd leave Corinth and go back to Judea, but uh, Judah. But now he's going to change of plan. So uh, you can take that off now. You get the idea then. What happened, he didn't do that. So the accusation against him was verse 17. Therefore, I was not vacillating when I intended to do this, was I? Or what I purpose? Do I purpose according to the flesh? And as I just do what, you know, and say things in the flesh... Uh, without really, you know, being sensitive to the Spirit. Uh, so that with me there is yes, yes, and no, no at the same time. In other words, I speak out of both sides of my mouth. I'm coming, but, you know, what their accusation is, he didn't really intend to come. He didn't keep his word anyway. If you can't keep his word on a simple thing like a physical trip, how can you trust him in his teaching? We look at it and say, is this... Really, criticism coming from the church at Corinth, established by Paul, uh, ministered to by Paul, have the inspired word of God in the first letter to the Corinthians, and now they accuse him on such a trivial matter. Uh, and, and so you see failure to show up. Here the man has gone through a time of trial that he was on the point of physical death. I mean, you know, true believers ought to think. You make certain promises or commitments, but James says you always do. I'll go tomorrow to this city and conduct this business if the Lord wills. Whether you verbally say it or not, as a believer, it's always in my mind. God controls tomorrow, I don't. Here's my plan for tomorrow. I'm going to meet you for an appointment at 10:15 at a certain location. I don't show up. You say you just can't believe Gil. But I got hit by a car on the way. I'm in the hospital. You know, that's what the Corinthians are doing. Here's a man at the point of death over an age, and they're criticizing him because he didn't uh, arrive on time on a trip. And these are supposed to be godly people. Uh, come back to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 1. Then I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as the men of flesh, as the infants in Christ. Verse 3. You are still fleshly, since there's jealousy, strife among you. Are you not fleshly, walking like mere men? You know, like, like men who haven't been converted, don't have the spirit. Uh, they're still practicing those kind of things. 
And you know, if we're honest, we think back, a lot of the things we criticize one another for, you look back on it, they were really trivial, weren't they? We got upset about this. We were critical about that. Uh, We made a fuss over this. And now, years later, if somebody brought it up, we'd be embarrassed because it was so trivial. I can't believe I was so small when I did that, when I said that, when I carried on like that. You know, believers, we need to stop and think, is this pleasing to the Lord? Is this a manifestation of His grace? I mean, if they, you know, we're all glad that things are wiped clean. Um, because we don't want those things brought up. You know, we can prevent a lot of it. Most church splits, now some of them are over doctrine. You have to stand for doctrine. You have to stand for the moral character and purity of the church, and so on. But we get into trivial, unimportant things. We question people's motives. Uh, we just don't like them. And so we look for reasons to not like them. Uh, Paul has to deal with this. Yeah, I wasn't speaking out of both sides of my mouth. Verse 18, as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. I don't say two different things. For the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who was preached among us by you. Now he takes them back to their uh, first visit when they preached the gospel. Acts 18, by me, Silvanus, Timothy, was not yes and no, but yes in him. It was a firm, clear statement. And you recognized it as such and you believed it. For as many as are the promises of God, in him they are yes. Therefore also through him is our amen to the glory of God through him. All I do is give you the word of God and confirm it with my agreement. That's where I stand. All these attacks on my character, on my trustworthiness, reliability, they're nothing to me. As he told him in the first letter, it's a small thing that I should be judged by men. But this influence is growing. It hasn't gone away. They're listening to false teachers who do have ulterior motives, undermining their confidence in Paul and thus the message that he preaches. Um, The promises, the word of God are yes. They're confirmed. And they are clear. And that's where we stand. So we want to be careful as a church that we don't follow the model of the Corinthians. They're addressed as a true church of believers. But things have corrupted this church and false teachers have permeated. And certain conduct just ought not to be among God's people. We are linked together till the throne, before the throne of the judge of all men the one who will judge our hearts. And my greatest concern is that you look as good as you can. Be in the best condition you can be in because you'll be my joy and crown. And that ought to be your attitude toward me and our attitude toward one another. We're in this together. I want to do all I can to help you grow. You want to do all you can to help me grow. Um, we're going to the throne together. God's joined us together. We want to live like people who have that kind of commitment to one another and appreciation of one another and ministry to one another. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, the power of your salvation that has worked in our lives. How awesome it is to be your family. Lord, you brought us together So that through the various things you bring into our lives personally and as a congregation, we can grow and mature. We can learn to appreciate one another. We can commit ourselves to helping one another grow, to work through trials and difficulties and struggles, anticipating the time when we will stand as a family of believers in your presence You will judge the motives of our heart. 
May we be found faithful. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.